And now, a show with inappropriate language, The Power Movement. Welcome to The Powell Movement. I'm your host, Mike Powell, and this week, well, life is kind of back to normal. The kid is back in school, and I can focus on doing work during the day instead of having to figure out something to do each day for a quarantine summer with an only child. That stuff is behind me. Another thing that's finally behind me is my use of nicotine. For the first time in like 20 years, I am 100% nicotine-free, and it is quite amazing. I smoked cigarettes and dipped until about 2009. That's the year I found out I was having a kid, so I did what any responsible adult would do. I switched to snooze. And snooze is great until you realize that you have a snooze in your mouth every waking minute of the day. So I decided that I needed to cut out tobacco altogether other than spliffs. So I started chewing Nicorette gum. That shit is the best gum on the planet and I chewed it daily since about 2013. I loved it. It was expensive though. But you know me, I'm Jewish and I knew how to find the deals. I would buy gum from Europe at a fraction of the cost of the gum here in the U.S. and I would do that through eBay. It took some planning, but I'm sure I saved myself thousands over the years. And if you knew me over the past decade, I was always chewing gum and most likely I offered you a piece of Nicorette gum with the pitch that it is the best gum you will ever chew. But when the quarantine started, I was like, I need to quit this gum. So I got myself the patch. And the patch works in three two-week steps. So it's six weeks worth of patches that I bought on eBay. And other than leaving a tape residue all over my body, the patch works. It works really well, and it gives you some amazingly real crazy dreams at night. But when I got to the end of my patches, I wasn't mentally ready to be done with nicotine. So I ended up buying another batch of the smallest patches and using them for another three months. But finally, a month ago, I was like, I'm not ordering any more patches, and I'm done forever with spliffs. So I quit. And quitting was easy because I haven't been addicted to cigarettes in like a decade. I'm pretty psyched on this because back in the day, if you asked me when I was going to quit smoking and start eating healthier, I would have told you that I'd do that after my first heart attack. And maybe I'm going through a midlife crisis or something right now, but I'm starting to do shit that I never ever did before. See, up until I had my child, I was the most unhealthy person you knew. Fast food diet, shit tons of soda, spliffs, cigs, some real Rory Silva type shit. And the only exercise I was doing was the activities that I liked doing. Skiing, wake skating, and that's about it. While I like to think I was a fun person, health was not a word I would have used to describe me. But when I had my kid, I started eating about 30% better and chewing that Nicorette gum. But other than that, not much had changed. Fast forward to the quarantine and when I started doing my online beer drinking challenges on Instagram back in April. That was a couple months into the quarantine. We had been staying home and drinking beer and smoking meat on the Traeger pretty much every night. At that point, I weighed almost 190 pounds. And for the past 20 years, my weight has pretty much stayed around 185. So I was putting on some weight and I had to do something to make sure that I didn't get really fat. So I decided to ride the Peloton bike that we had. And I did that every single day. And when I say I'm going to do something, I do it, even if it isn't fun. And 180 bike rides later, I've lost 15 pounds and I'm interested in my personal health for the first time in my entire life. People who really know me and hear this, their minds are most likely blown as I used to laugh at people who wasted their time exercising. But if I look at my life, snow was a passion since I was a kid and I was fueling that with sugar and not so healthy stuff. And then as I got older, I started transitioning into alcohol and even more fun stuff. And while I still enjoy a cold 10 barrel, I can say that I also enjoy drinking a lot more water these days. So my life is pretty much a parallel with my guest career this week. While I've been talking about exercise, Steve Nilsson is a dude who doesn't need exercise. His nickname, which everyone knows him by, is Sticks with an X, and he got it because his legs are really, really skinny. But his career parallels my life. He came up in a cake eater town, got a job in snowboarding, and parlayed that into a game-changing energy drink. From that energy drink, he went to a culture-changing beer, and then he went back to health with a death metal water brand. He's created a path that had him working with the best brands when they were at their absolute peak. And before we talk about that all on the podcast, I want to ask you to do a few things for me. First, I want you to subscribe to the podcast wherever you listen to it. Next, I want you to tell a friend about the show. 
And finally, I want you to follow me on Instagram at The Powell Movement. I also want to ask you to support my great sponsors who make this show happen. They are Stanley, Peter Glenn Ski and Sports, and the Ten Barrel Brewery. Now, let's talk with Steve Sticks Nilsson. Growing up in Minnesota, it's such a strange thing when thinking of your career because growing up there, did you do all the good things that Minnesotans are known for, like hockey and ice fishing and Juicy Lucy's? <laughs> I can't speak to Juicy Lucy. And the funny part is, yes, fishing's huge, land of 10,000 lakes. But the only one in our family that actually like went out of his way to do it was my father. But even then, it was like him and his buddies would go somewhere like to Canada or Alaska or whatever. He wouldn't go to the local lake and fish. Then as you get older, the joke becomes, do you fish? Yeah, I drink. That's literally <laughs> the Minnesota thing. And then hockey, of course, where I was raised, there's literally outdoor rinks. My parents had two walking distances. So that's what you did. You went with your friends, mom would pack a lunch, and you were there all day with your buddies. That's all you did all day long. And I think that's why Minnesotans have got to be such good skaters. I mean, just the mechanics of how kids from Minnesota skate. It's just different. I don't know how else to explain it to you, but the motion, how smooth they are, like for the most part, you're always going to have a few sleds, but it's what you did. And it was so fun because there's a sense of community and competitiveness. That's Minnesota at hockey. I believe the state high school hockey tournament is the biggest high school tournament of any sport in the nation, even more so than Texas football. That means a lot. That's big. It's one of the one states in the country where I don't think inline skating ever lost its cool because people grew up skating in Minnesota and people always did it. You know what's so funny you say that is that getting into action sports in the midnight, you know, rollerblading or whatever you want to call it, inline skating was part of X Games. I mean, that was literally one of the disciplines. They founded it. X Games would not have existed without the rollerblade money that started it. And there was like 10 disciplines. Yeah, yeah. And it's so funny because a lot of my friends do that, but it was literally something you did in the off season for hockey. There was never any like, Baggy jeans with a gigantic chain. Right. It was literally, I've got workout shorts on and I'm going to go around one of the lakes for cardio, for like keeping your legs, so to speak. Yep. I mean, the whole thing, whether rollerblading is cool or not, it doesn't matter to them. They use it strictly to stay in shape. It's not anything, there's no image to it. There's no whatever. So it's funny when I tell people, if someone said to me, did you have rollerblades? I'm like, well, not the kind that you'd expect, like the boots, like the plastic ones. They were hockey skate upper with wheels on the bottom, not roller skates, but like inline but they were literally for performance, meaning you are going around a lake sprinting, like almost like a speed skater. You know what I mean? Yep. But it was strictly for cardio. It was no negative connotation because I maybe you don't know this, the rollerblade was started in Minnesota. I know a lot about that sport. Yeah, so that's what I was asking because I've traveled to that state and the biggest inline skate event in the country is in Duluth, Minnesota. And they still get, although they won't get it this year because of the virus, but they still get like 3,000 skaters every year. And while that might have been 20,000 skaters at one point, 3,000 is a lot for any inline event. But we're not going to talk about inline at all. No. But one thing we are going to talk about is Minnesota. And it's not just Minnesota that you're from. You're from Edina. And for those that don't know, <laughs> that's where the privileged rich kids in Minnesota live. And what did your folks do for money? My father, to be honest with you, he's lived the American dream. His father was a pastor in South Dakota and basically made $3,000 a year, a year. So the only way they were fed was by the church. And he realized real quick that was not the best way to live. And I'll make a long story short, he ended up going to school in Minnesota, first in his class, but to pay for medical school, he went to the Air Force and was a flight surgeon. And then he started his own practice as an ophthalmologist. And my mother was a nurse and that's how they met. Huh. So when I asked my dad, how did you end up in Edina? And he said, you know, I have a family of six and I needed to be close to the hospital. And so the house that we grew up in, they just sold it a couple of years ago. They had it for 50 some years, was eight minutes from the hospital. He was just looking somewhere he could afford a house. You know, this is the 60s, mind you. And he had no clue what that meant. It was a happy accident. So that's how that came to be. Okay. And one thing that you had that most people didn't have in Minnesota is relatives in Hawaii. And were you able to get out of Minnesota and go to Hawaii a bunch? Yeah. So that's so funny you asked that. So back in the day before it became Delta Airlines, there's Northwest Orient Airlines. That was based out of Minneapolis. They were one of the first ones to fly direct to Japan. Not obviously was happening from the West Coast, but I'm saying being a Midwest city. And as luck would have it, go with me here, my mother's sister ended up marrying a guy in the military who was based in Hawaii. They literally were based there. 
and became friends with some of the local families and whatnot. And I'm going to make a point here at the end of this. So we would actually go over there. That was our one trip a year. We would fly over to Honolulu and then over to Maui and got to see things way back in the day. And my cousin, so that would be my mother's sister's son, married an actual Hawaiian girl, meaning her mom is like 100% Hawaiian. But yes, I started going over, but it was, you could, Hawaii was like something they advertised all the time in Minneapolis because my God, middle of February, you give anything to be on a beach. It's miserable in the winters there, I would think. Absolutely. It could be rough. If you're not a hockey player, yeah. Or you're not an ice fisherman. Yeah, it could be rough okay. for sure. So when you go to Hawaii, I mean, I think that's where you fall in love with surf culture. And is it something where you're just seeing it? Or is it something where you're actually learning how to surf when you go on these trips? Body surfing was the thing you started with. And of course, boogie boarding or dick dragging, whatever they call it, uh, the locals. But through high school, I dabbled in it. But I was never going to get barreled or anything like that. I dabbled in the longboard and whatnot going out there. But more importantly, like anything, just looking the part. But it obviously doesn't help you look the part. If you dress like a skater and you can't skate, you know, it'll be pretty evident pretty quick. Right. I think for me, we just didn't have clothes like that. We didn't have anything like that in Minnesota. There was no such thing as a Zoomy. There was no such thing as a Pac Sun. There certainly wasn't. Maybe one independent skate shop, actually it's called The Alt, it's still in business, believe it or not. I think it was the first Burton account in the Midwest, it's still going on there. But yes, to answer your question, I started noticing it. And whatever my DNA is, I just was really attracted to the way the clothes looked and the kind of the lifestyle that went with it. You know what I'm saying? Like I wore a town and country shirt, I kind of felt like a surfer. Yeah. You know what I mean? Which fast forward, look at Roxy did, how much they blew up. They made a girl in Omaha feel like a surfer. Yeah. That's the example I always use. So... That's how that light bulb went off. And then the logical progression would be for you to find surfing and whether you're getting into it or not, or just you're into the lifestyle, you get back to Minnesota and that's a place where everything is five years behind. So town and country shirts aren't going to be available for five years there because I feel like that's how Minnesota lives. But do you start skateboarding next? Yeah, it's funny. My brother, and I still have his board and it's, it's worn off. I can't read the top, but he, he had gotten one in the 70s. The first one was like fiberglass. And then he had one that I have now. Literally, it's like metal, but it has rubber wheels. So it's not the old clay wheels or anything. And I can't seem to find the brand name, which I still have it to this day. And then my sister, she's the one closest to me. I have two older sisters too, between my brother and I. She had a Hobie skateboard that I always wanted to use. And there was this little tiny shop that opened up right on the edge of our town that I would go to. And it didn't last super long, but I ended up buying my first deck. It was a Sims Andrecht from the alt. I'll never forget it was red. My identical twin teenage boys are dying for me to find it. But I, a buddy of mine, I remember borrowed it. He was going to do some work on it for me. I never got it back like mm -hmm. in college. But that became my transportation for years. And speaking of college, I would even skateboard down to the local liquor store and grab beers for the night and we'd skate back because it was a big, huge deck. It was a platter. Yep. So anyone could use it. I can't tell you how many people took turns on it because it was so stable. And those big gummy wheels? Oh yeah. And it had huge indie trucks probably the widest ones they made, you know, but that's really it. And then on top of that, when you'd go to the altar somewhere, they would have one little waterfall rack of t-shirts, just one of like independent or Hasoy, you know what I mean? Something yep. that was just the little tidbits you could find from that. But even more importantly, what was the Pandora's box for me is that's where I started looking through Frasher. So back to why real quick, I actually, after being there, I had subscriptions to surfer and surfing magazine. So I would get those for years and just looking at the ads. And obviously there's a lot of beautiful women in there and all that stuff, but I was getting these things and I was just living vicariously through these magazines. So you've got that, you get your first skate deck and with skateboarding comes punk rock. And you guys had such a cool scene in Minnesota. You still do. I mean, with most things, like I said, Minnesota's three years behind, but with music, you have first Ave, you have bands. And what was the scene like when you were in high school and what were the shows like that you were seeing or what shows were you seeing? Well, actually, <laughs> I'm speaking on both sides of my mouth here because I'm not a pack rat. If you ever see my home, it's very Spartan. I don't have clutter because I just grew up in a house of knickknacks. But the one thing I saved is I have old ticket stubs. Uh huh. And now I'm really happy I do because I notice some people on social media will go, oh my God, look at this. And someone will show like a Nirvana ticket stub or some crazy lineup that you couldn't a million years do it again. You know what I mean? It was like Foo Fighters and Rollins Band and something really obscure, but like really cool lineup. So the school I went to, was not a punk rock type thing. Like any high school, you're going to have those people. You were a private school kid, right? Yes, yeah. But the flip side is with that, you had some really, really smart kids. So even the kids, so to speak, that were a little more punk rock, let's say, 
still bright kids, right? So there were bands in school. And I'm not seeing the high schools any different than anyone else, but it was just, there was this thing with music. I don't know what it is. Everyone was kind of revolved around the whole punk rock, new wave, what do you want to call it? So I remember going down to First Avenue and back in the day, they'd have the all ages shows and they'd have the night shows. So literally, if the descendants came to town, they would play two shows in a day, which I don't know how they did it back in the day, if you think about it. Yeah. But I remember going to one of my first shows, I think it was the descendants in the seventh street entry. And I'm standing there and all of a sudden they kick into whatever song it was. And everyone just went nuts. The pit started. It was crazy. I just wasn't ready for it. And I had so much fun, but I remember leaving there completely sopping wet. I'm missing a shoe, whatever else. And going, I, I just love the energy of it. Something that is complete antithesis of what's going on in the world right now. There couldn't have been a more unsanitary situation. Right. Literally, <laughs> you know, spit, blood, everything everywhere. But something about that, the power where you felt the monitor in like your chest. And the entry is, for those who don't know, it's a tiny little fire trap room. I mean, low ceiling, small, but it has so much character. And like Pearl Jam played there when they first started. Everyone's played there. Yeah, I mean, name it. They played there. Prince was like, would just show up and play whenever he wanted, right? Yep, exactly, exactly. First Avenue was an old bus depot that was like an asbestos dump. They actually just redid it, but anyone who's anyone plays First Avenue. So that was the one beautiful thing with Minneapolis is that I always would tell people, Minneapolis has everything New York, LA has, just a much, much smaller version. But also, you know, with touring bands and whatnot, it was easier to get tickets to shows in Minneapolis, especially back then compared to now, because you go to LA or New York, good luck. Yeah. Scalpers snap them, especially now with the internet and all that. But before you literally had to wait in line in the cold, with your friends, hands in your pocket, you're totally ill prepared, especially in the cold winter, just to wait in line to pay your seven bucks to go in and see, you know, the butthole surfers. Yeah. And suddenly we would go to these shows just by the name. We almost didn't even know who they were. What really was a big help to me was Thrasher, especially because they had ads for SST records. Mm -hmm. And that, all my favorite bands were on SST, like Husker Du, The Descendants, The Minutemen. I mean, name it, were on SST. They would advertise. I'm like, oh, I want to see that band. So anyone was related to SST, it would be the early epitaph. That was the bands I wanted to see. You just assumed they were going to be good. And, you know, there were some better than others, but I, I saw some unbelievable shows growing up. Unbelievable. That's so cool that you had that right at your disposal. I've been there and really a, an amazing place to see a show. But the crazy thing is the juxtaposition of your life because your lifestyles, punk rock, skate, but you have a sports side and hockey's a big deal. Do you play football as well? Yeah, I did. I mean, I wasn't really good at any of these things, but I made my own way. I mean, let's call a spade a spade, man. Where I grew up, I wasn't even the best player in my neighborhood. <laughs> it's insane, the athletes I grew up around. So, you know, whatever my little place in, and that that is great. But when you don't have all this stuff to do, what do you do all day? You you play ball, anything. Yeah, I played hockey and football, but we played baseball and soccer and tennis and golf and whatever we could get our hands on. And I worked at, it's called Braemar Golf Course, which still exists to this day. That's where I've worked in the summers. And that's what you did. With sports, like you have hockey and are the dreams pro hockey, or you also have the skate and surf thing. And I don't know, like who's more important to you, Dean Youngblood or Rick Kane? <laughs> oh my God. That is amazing. You know, Youngblood, the movie, funny story. The guy who directed and produced that movie went to my high school. I hate Recky. Exactly. Come on, Swayze in that movie. Yeah. <laughs> but honestly, are you asking me, which pro athlete do I respect more or which would I would have wanted to been or which? Yeah. Back then, where do you want to be? Was hockey a more important thing or was like surfing and that lifestyle more important to you when you're, you know, late high school and you're getting into college? Well, by about peewees, you know, if you're going to be doing anything with your hockey, let's put it that way. Yep. The dream growing up, it wasn't the Minnesota North Stars, which was the team, you know, this is now the Dallas Stars. It was to play for the University of Minnesota Gophers. That was like the hardest ticket in town to get. They were perennial top five every year. But you learn pretty quick, especially where I was raised, that that is not going to happen. These kids are so good, the ones I grew up around. It was insane. So that was by about phantoms. I was like, yeah, I'll try to play my role here. But honestly, of all the sports, snowboarding, which is what I do the most, skating and surfing, if you were to say to me, what were you going to be? I would say surf all day long. And yeah, you got to contend with drowning or sharks or whatever. But look at a pro surfer, man. The lifestyle is incredible. Incredible. I mean, I want to go to the Maldives. I've never been to Bali, even though that's pretty blown out now. You know what I mean? I used to live in Australia, so I saw that. And yes, there are dangers with surfing. Absolutely. You got the, even the sun. You got to be careful with skin cancer. But I would take that because think of what you get to do. And I mean, look how many people aspire to do that. And that's a touch point for people going, 
you wear that shirt or you're part of that brand, you watch that video, it takes you away from where your cube somewhere, or if you live in a place you don't want to live in, surfing that hits a nerve with people for the most part. I'm not saying everybody wants to do that, but once you catch your first wave, you never go back. I don't do drugs, but I'm assuming it's like a crack high where you're like, I could never go back now to the normal world. Yeah, no, and people dedicate their lives to it. But you at this point, it's time for college. You end up at Hamline University. That's close yep. to home. It's in a place that has some amazing antique stores from what I know in St. Paul. <laughs> and on your LinkedIn, it says that you played football and hockey in college. I couldn't confirm it, but did you play in college as well? Yeah, yeah. I mean, not very well, but I did the best I could. Were you recruited to play or was it something that you no, just... No, no, not really. You know, it's Division Three. And ironically, my whole family had gone to a rival school called St. Olaf, which is a similar size to Hamlin. That's in Northfield, Minnesota. And so I feel like I had already gone to St. Olaf by the time it was my turn to go to college. So I opted to take a different route. But my buddies who I went to school with, like 95% of them, if not more, went away out of state to school. Yep. And I did the opposite opposite because when I finished at Hamlin, I moved away and they all came back. And now when I go home and I haven't lived in Minneapolis since, I see all my friends. It's awesome because they're all back now. You know what I mean? Yeah. You realize as you get older in life that things like sports and whatnot, that the friendships are bigger than that, you know? Yeah. I don't know if you played all four years of sports in college, but it seems like during your college career, you took advantage of every opportunity possible between internships and studying abroad. You were doing it. And what made you want to go to Australia to do the study abroad program? Was it just to be around surf and surf culture? <laughs> well, the summer after high school, I went to Australia on a five or six week program through my high school. We started in Fiji and then went to Australia and then we went to New Zealand. It was like a crash course, basically, on those different countries. And I was just taken aback by it. And in the back of my head, I'm like, I got to get down here again. Because my siblings had done study abroad, but they were in Europe. My brother went to London School of Economics. And his sister was in France. And another sister was in Norway and Spain. Yeah, back to your point. The, the sun, the surf, <laughs> the nicer climate just really hit a nerve with me. And then I went back in college for a summer, basically, to an actual school up in Queensland. And that's when it was in my head going, I'm going to come back. I'm going to be back here. I'm going to come back. And so literally my focus of the spring of my senior year was to try to get a job down there. And you have to have what's called a tax ID to be there legally yep. to work. And fortunately, a good friend of mine's father worked for a company based in Minneapolis, but they had a satellite office in Sydney. So he introduced me to the people there and they really were a really good foothold for me. Like I stayed with a family that put me up until I could get on my feet and I had a job down there. But I live in Bondi Beach. My bus stop was like right in front of the beach. Right in front of the metal ramps. You know what? It's so funny. It was the opposite side of the beach. So that was my thing. Every morning and night, I got to go to the beach. That was the, the motivation. And one of my internships, ironically, after I'd been on the study abroad program, I worked for what was Northwest Airlines, which became Delta, like I mentioned before, is they ironically started a route to Australia. So they actually, like someone would come to you in the snow industry and say, hey, we're going to get into the snow we're going to appeal to skiers, make sure that we don't look kooky in our ads. Well, they weren't saying it, but in so many words, they're like, hey, have a look at our ads or things for Australia. Does this resonate? Do you think this is a good representation of Australia so we're not offending the Australians? Because they had the token kangaroo. They had the token picture of the opera house in the background. That makes sense. You know, they did a good job, but I was able to get college credit. And here's the other motivation. Because of my internship, they couldn't pay me other than I did get credit, but they gave me four tickets to go wherever I wanted in the world. Wow. That's what my payment was. The first one I got was go right back to Australia. And that was after college. So that was how that came to be. Yeah. And I can imagine that when you go on these trips and then you come back to Minnesota, which is like the epicenter of a different culture, state fair and cheese curd culture. So you're doing these Australia trips, you're having an amazing time. And then you start doing all these internships. You work for the North Stars. You do a few different things in banking and realize that you don't want to be a desk jockey. And you get this gig to do a year in Australia. And is the plan pretty much, I'm going to go out to Australia. I've got a year here and I'm going to figure out what I'm going to do with my life while I'm there. Yeah. And I'm fully transparent about this. You know, at the time, especially the friends that I ran with were very, very dead focused on Wall Street. That was the thing. And back then that was like 
a cool thing to do. Not that it isn't now, but I'm seeing times have changed, obviously. But you went to a private school and you're one dude who's into surf and culture and all that stuff. But I'm sure a lot of the other Edina kids just want to be better than their parents. And Wall Street is a way to do that. Yeah, yeah that's a, actually a really good point. But the funny part is my best friend, God rest his soul, was the preppiest of preppy. He was into that more than anyone on this earth. And he ended up losing his life in 9-11 in the 104th floor of the South Tower. I'm sorry to hear that. No, no. And his name is Gordy Amoth, A-A-M-O-T-H. I named one of my sons after him. He's the first name on the victims list. But he was amazing athlete, amazing, hilarious, strong as an ox. But he, in his veins, had punk rock. So this guy would wear, if I can just sidebar story really quick. Sure. For years, he and I wouldn't see each other, but we would try to connect. And a lot of times it was around music. Well. I was friends with the guys in the band called System of a Down. They were playing New York City, and I was supposed to be with them to take him to the show. So they left credentials and the whole thing. I couldn't make it. Okay, this is like pre-cell phone days, right? This well, was flip phone days, basically. I couldn't make it, and I'm like trying to get a hold of him. Like, don't be, you know, don't be a prick, whatever. He went anyway, and I love the guy to death, but he's he's in kind of an ox. He doesn't have to pay attention to what he's doing. He's a bull in a china shop. <laughs> and the next morning, I call him. I said, "Dude, did you go to the show?" And he said, "Oh yeah, it was great." I was stage left the whole time. I was like, oh, God, man, what did you wear? And he goes, I was just wearing my suit. And I'm like, you wore a suit? to sit with He's like, And he goes, oh, it's awesome, dude. He goes, I walked in with my credential. Everyone moved out of the way because they thought I was their lawyer. So he said, everybody just part of the way. But he was in the pit with me all those years, all those years. But back to your original question, when, when I went to Australia, I'm just going to be honest with you. Everybody looked at me, I felt including family members, like I was off my rocker, like, okay, he's got to get serious here. All right. You got to do the, you know, get the job and punch the clock and that's it. And it's just that didn't sit right with me because some of it was for image, right? Some of it was not. And I was even offered a job from one of my good friend's dad, but it was like, I felt like it was just given to me. I didn't work for it. And it wasn't appealing to me because it's office space. There's a lot that resonates with that movie office space, right? There's yeah. a lot of truth to that movie. And I couldn't do it. But the problem is you got to live life. You got to earn some money. So when I'm in Australia, living the life down, trying to figure out what I'm doing, my buddies are on Wall Street. But it's funny how the roles were reversed because now with my career and I talk to my friends, they couldn't be prouder of me. You know, one of my best friends said to me, he's like, we all talked about you the other day. We can't wait to see what you do next. And that's just like so fun to hear your friends do that because there was a time there where I was like, yeah, I'm in Australia and I'm, no, I'm not a very good surfer. I'm doing it and I'm actually living the part. But in the back of my head, I'm going, what the hell am I going to do when I get back to the United States? Now it's time to take a sponsor break and start with the 10 Barrel Brewery out of Bend, Oregon. I always go on and on about how 10 Barrel's roots are found in the mountains, skiing, snowboarding, biking, and how their mantra is drinking beer outside. I mean, 10 Barrel creates tons of events, puts out ski and snowboard movies each year that are legit. They sponsor an A-list group of athletes and cool shit like this podcast. They have always stayed true to who they are, and they get it when it comes to action sports, and of course, they make some amazing beers. So I want you to support the 10 Barrel Brewery. And to do that, it's pretty easy. Next time you're at the store, pick up a six-pack of 10 Barrel and support the beer that supports you and me. You can find out more about all things 10 Barrel over at 10barrel.com. My next sponsor is Stanley. And your family has known them for over 100 years. They are the brand that invented the category of keeping beverages hot and cold. You may remember that green bottle that your grandpa kept his coffee in. Well. That's a Stanley, and they make so much more than that these days. I swear by the pint glasses and water bottles, and that's just the start of their product collection. For listening to this podcast, I'm going to save you 30% on all of Stanley's product collection. Here's what you need to do. Head on over to stanley-pmi.com, do some shopping, and when you check out, enter the code DRINKFAST, that's all lowercase, all one word, and you'll save 30%. Please buy something as Stanley is the best. Those are my sponsors. Now let's jump back into the podcast. When you get back to the States, what you do is you end up going to the Warp Tour. And it's like <laughs> everything that you like under one roof. And yep. it's kind of funny to say that the Warp Tour changed your life. But the Warp Tour kind of changed your life. 100%. And I remember it was the second year of it. And they weren't coming to Minneapolis. And so a girl I was dating at the time, I pulled it out of a newspaper and said, we got to go to this. It's the Eagles Ballroom in Milwaukee, which still exists. And she's like, what the hell are you talking about? And we were out late that night. And honest to God, I'm not joking. I think we went and saw Pantera or something the night before. So I was like super tired. So she drove from any, I think it's like a six hour drive to Milwaukee. 
and we got there at noon. And yes, I was like Charlie and Chocolate Factory. I'm just standing in place, just looking at all these booths. And I saw all these people handing out CD-ROM. I'm not <laughs> kidding you. CD And I was like, that's so cool, CD-ROM. And it was like Liquid Force Wakeboards and Split, if you remember that clothing brand. Yeah. And Billabong, but the old logo. You know, it's obviously way before energy drinks. And then if you looked at the lineup, speaking of old stubs, you couldn't put a lineup together like that if you tried right now. Yeah. And it was such a great mix of bands. But yeah, that was it. That's when it was just like, I need to be a part of this. I mean, 100%. You leave the Warp Tour and you realize, fuck Wall Street. I'm going to get a cool job. And the way to do that is the trade show. And back in the day, SIA was in Vegas. And you're a kid from the Midwest who's going to make things happen for himself. But you know no one in the industry, really, I wouldn't think. And how strange is it for you as like a young go-getter to show up at this trade show You're in Vegas, blinded by the light, and then every brand that is important to you is there? Are you nervous? Are you just a go-getter getting every business card you can? How does that work? Oh, uh, I was both. Well, there's something about the Midwest, how you're raised or what the manners you get. I don't know. Just, you know. Midwestern values? Yeah, yeah. And so I was just believed that, you know, nice to people look them in the eye, firm handshake, be that. And I didn't know this whole bro culture. So yeah, it was very eye-opening for me, but you got to remember the sizzle of that. Being at one of those shows and just looking around and just seeing how crazy it was. It was like people you saw in magazines. You, you turn the corner and there's someone, I mean, it was the first time I ever experienced the Reef Girls. You know, back in the day, that was like the booth to be at because they'd have these beautiful models there signing posters. It was very eye-opening because I think that, you know, educated in the Midwest, whatever, they looked at me like I had three heads. You know, and for the record, I thought I was going to be a copywriter because I thought that'd be the least painful adult job to have. But yeah, I was sleeping on the floor of the Stardust <laughs> that my buddy's cousin had run with guys. And that was back in the scrappy snowboard days. And he had a brand called Black Spoon. That was an outerwear brand. They gave me the badge to get in the show. And I was just, again, deer in the headlights, but not, not in a way that I was intimidated to talk to anyone, but I hate to say it. I felt like kind of like Woody from Cheers. Yeah, I mean, I can see you coming in like, I don't want to say like a kook per se, but not knowing how the industry works and being the innocent Midwest kid. Yeah, I can see that being awkward, but you do make some connections and your Airwalk story has been told a million times. You pretty much zone in on one person with emails and letters, then call them and yep. their house had just burnt down. So you decide to send them a fire detector, which is kind of like, hey, I'm going to be funny and keep me at the top of her mind all at the same time. And that ends up getting you a job. It did. But that was also something I learned being an intern at an ad agency. It was called Carmichael Lynch. And one of their accounts was Harley Davidson. And it was just, you're always thinking of ways to stand out, right? What are you going to do to capture someone's attention? It doesn't network. It's an old boy. It's not what you know. It's who you know. Yep. I mean, I have a guy who's the president of a bank now, literally a president of a major bank. And he went to Arizona State. And he had the best four years of his life almost a blur and he always jokes that he got a job at a trading desk because of his buddy's dad great but he's beating up guys who went to kellogg or wharton but it's just because the dad this is who he knew and now he's obviously took advantage of it he's a president so making yourself stick out is a way to get noticed for a job what other secret job techniques have you employed or seen over the years for people to get their jobs God, you know um that's a really good question because I literally kind of go off my network versus going off a recruiter. I've never ever used a recruiter for me personally. And this, that's no disrespect to recruiters or headhunters. I just never use them because if I have a specific role to hire for, I will go off of my peers. But with, you know, the, some of the roles I was saying I was at Red Bull for when their mother would apply for it. But these are even some of the, I hate to say it, but more the bro things where they were kind of pro bros, where they kind of bounced brand to brand and there was no substance there. It was like, yeah, you're the guy who showed up and the trans world recaps or whatever. Yeah. The free cocktails or free kegs at the end of a trade show. But I never knew what they did. What did you do? You know what I mean? But a lot of it really was recommendations from peers. So I wouldn't say anyone per se did something that stopped me out of the gate, but I do have some examples of people where I met them in person. They brought something very unique where I was like, okay, that's rad. And I remember a classy example is there's a dear friend of mine, my name is Mike Arts, and he's an industry guy. Started at Burton way back when. Public Works now, I think? Yep, Public Works. That's exactly who it is. I was just actually with him this morning, ironically. And 
we had a position open at Airwalk. We needed someone to basically run the snow program because though this is the waning days of Airwalk, we still had a skin in the game, so to speak, or a place at the table of snowboarding. But we needed someone really to come in and handle the team, put that back together again. And then, you know, a lot of things. And I'll never forget Mike showed up and I was one of the people hiring him with another counterpart who were all three of us are dear friends to this day. And one thing that stuck out of it is Mike, you could just tell he loves snowboarding so much. He just talked about how this was his passion. So he's a kid growing up in Connecticut. So similar situation to me, right? He's in Connecticut and he brought slides. Okay. A slide, like, you know, then a plastic sheet. Yep. And we got a light box. He hands me the little micro and there I look through and there is this ramp that he had put together in his yard that went into a jump. And it was funny because you could tell it was typical Connecticut snow where they got a bunch of snow, but it started to melt. So you could see the grass. And he built this haggard little, it's just a tetanus shot all over it. I'm sure there's nails sticking out. Everything. <laughs> he got to be really good with his hands and, and woodwork. But he was so passionate about snowboarding that he built this haggard ramp. There's a drop-in ramp to hit this little jump to flat in his parents' yard. And I remember going, all right, this kid gets it. He is bleeding snowboarding, you know? Mm-hmm. So that was very smart of Mike because it was a visual. Who doesn't like visuals, right? He never said, I'm your guy. You should hire me. Nothing. It was more... I just want to show you how much it means to me and I'm going to help keep the scope going, so to speak with Airwalk and the rest is history. That would be the best example I have of someone showing me something, but it wasn't something that just showed up in a box. There was a few other jobs I applied trying that and it, it never went anywhere, you know, cause I thought it was creative. And one I did was believe it or not, I think it's WWF or WWE, whatever it is, whatever the major wrestling thing is in Connecticut was hiring a marketing person and wrestling it was originally out of Minnesota. They had the AWA, whatever. You've watched every Sunday morning. And they had some marketing. It was intrigued. So I actually sent my resume superimposed like on a bent up folding chair. <laughs> so I smashed against the wall and everything. And everyone's looking at me like, this guy's really got issues. You know, he's smashing this folding chair on the ground, but I needed to look all bent up. And then I went to Kinko's and took my resume, but put it on kind of a clear sheet, kind of like you do for an overhead back in the day. Yep. And I had it like put on the seat itself and sent to this hiring manager. And she called and she's like, Dude, we just got this giant box from you, this chair. Why did you send that? And that's all I needed to hear. So like, if you don't understand the humor in that, like what I'm trying to do here. Yeah, you don't get it. I don't know. I, I don't know who you're looking for because you think they would, but I literally got that call. Like, why did you send us a banged up chair? And I'm like, have you ever watched a wrestling match? Yeah. Like, I mean, <laughs> it makes you wonder, right? Yeah. So again, that didn't work, but it was something that you just made me think of. I dug that out of my files here of something way back in the day. Well, when it did work was with Airwalk and you get a gig there that's kind of a marketing job. You're doing merchandising, going store to store and probably not what you want to do with the rest of your career, but a great way to learn the ground floor of the industry. And what do you walk away from the merchandising stuff learning? Well, first and foremost, it was the beginning of the end because we shouldn't be in malls. You know, Airwalk paved the way for all the brands that are in malls now. At the time, you got to remember Vans was probably the next biggest competitor. We'd all but choke them out. And then there was Duff's and Etnies, I want to say, were the other brands. But I started learning more and more at seeing what brands are doing because I would call on independent shops as well. And that was much more of a safe harbor for me, meaning I got that more. It was more my speed. It's where you could go just chill with dudes and talk to them. Yes. And they always had videos on. I just dug it. I just dug that whole vibe of what they were doing. But I started complaining about what we were missing product wise. So I go to these stores and see what the snow boots were going, all that. And they were like, okay, tough guy. And I got a product development offer and moved to Pennsylvania. So they moved the, the company, which I was all stoked thinking I was going to go to Carlsbad and they moved to Pennsylvania. But I was spending a bunch of time in Asia. So the combination of building something, you're held to that because more so than a designer, you've got to take the design and make sure that it's being developed correctly in the factory. Oh yeah, it's on your shoulders. Something goes wrong. It's totally on your shoulders. But I've always been a very detail-oriented guy. And back then, we didn't have all the fancy programming they have now. We would Rochambeau to see who'd send the 80-page fax to the factory. So you'd be there at the office like 2 in the morning making sure every single page went through. And you got the report showing all of them went through. Because if you missed a page and they screw something up into production, it's your fault. Yeah, but even before all that, you're a marketing guy and you come into a lot of these meetings telling them what they need to be doing. And they're like, all right, tough guy, you're going to start developing the product. But what's that learning curve like? You're not an engineer by any means. You don't know CAD and all those things that you have to know. People go to school for four years and then more so to figure out how to do that. You're trial by fire. And what's that learning curve like for a marketing guy? Well, I had a really good boss 
who is the one who gave me the nickname Sticks, which was bestowed on me forever ago. But he took me under his wing and basically said, if you learn how the process of development, because you got to remember, I'm not responsible for drawing these things. I'm not responsible for doing all the specs. We have tech packs, they're called, and whatnot to follow. But that's all the job of the designer. Like they've got to make sure that's dialed. And my boss would oversee everything to make sure there wasn't anything missed before, especially if it was a plastic molded piece. You have no room for error there. I mean, that mold's got to be precise. My job was to make sure that everything was in order. And I was basically going down the list with the factory to make sure that they were following all the protocols, what was required of this product. So I wasn't designing, but where my strength was because I spent time at retail, I would like to think more often than not, when we do a line review and all the designs are on the wall of the conference room, I would pick out the ones that would sell, if that makes sense. The silhouette, what would look best on the shelf, what whatever. And that really helped me because I am way into attention to detail. So it kind of played right into what I do. Yes, marketing was what I thought my love was, but this is something where I'm like, wow, this kind of feeds into the fact that I am very organized. And that really helped. Plus, I started getting really good relationships with the skaters and the snowboarders and could ask them what works for you. I was more on the, the boot side, but even on the skate side, I could give my two bits. If they said, hey, the Ollie area needs to be reinforced here, or we need to have a lace saver for the guys who are doing vert, because at the time, Airwalk had the vert team with Bucky and Tony Hawk yeah. and Andy McDonald and Rune Glyphberg when he was doing vert. I was able to kind of be that middleman, so to speak, where they, that some of the athletes, especially on the snow side, felt comfortable with me. Yeah. And they could give me feedback and know that I would actually listen because hey, it still happens this day. Action sports, it's a lot of hollow promises. It's like, they'll tell you what you want to hear, but it kind of goes one ear out the other. And that's just not the way I was raised. You listen, and then if you tell you you're going to do something, do it. That's how that unfolded. Yeah, and so there's Nike, there's Reebok, and there's Airwalk. So you guys are way bigger than anyone at that point, and you're still perceived as cool. What's the size of a company like that back then? Are there hundreds of people at Airwalk? You know, I don't remember the exact headcount. Internally, it wasn't that big. I can't speak to the Carlsbad days, the internal part, because just when I was moving to be quote unquote internal, they moved everything to Pennsylvania. Right. So Pennsylvania, all in, I mean, it wasn't in the hundreds by any stretch. I'm going to guess 50 people. I, I don't remember. And then you had the reps in the field, but you know, they were on such a tear to that point where it was just so mismanaged, I guess. Let's just leave it at that. And I've said this before that I'm the only one in my family without an MBA you know, or a graduate degree. And I got one at Airwalk. <laughs> on how to really almost go out of your way to screw up a brand, which is a shame in hindsight, because they were on such a roll in the mid nineties to the point where and I cannot confirm this. It's, it was a rumor story, but it's interesting. Nonetheless, George Yon, rest his soul, who founded Airwalk. The story goes that Phil Knight started seeing the, the acceleration of Airwalk and was very interested in the story is said that George turned to Phil because they were probably at a footwear convention or that's what I'm told. Son, I might own you someday. That's what George John said to Phil Knight. Whether that's true or not, I, I can't confirm, but it's a nice uh, wise tale. You know what I mean? Who yeah. knows? But that didn't happen, obviously. No. And at that point, you know, like 96-ish, I remember Airwalk was going around with a BMX and skate tour. They had a truck pulling ramps, which was revolutionary for that time. And they were selling a shit ton of shoes. Then in the snowboarding era, you know, I snowboarded for like a decade before I went back to skiing. And one of the last boots I owned was probably one that you built. But product design is not what you're all about with Airwalk the whole time. You've proven that you can be successful at it. But when do they hand you the keys for the snow marketing? Well, again, it was kind of a progression. It was perfect time in my life to be in product development because, you know, I lived in a furnished apartment. And at one point I was in Asia like three weeks a month for a spell there. Miserable. So I was never around. But if you get in, in, in certain parts of this product development lifestyle or whatever you want to call it, you just become a hired gun. You could bounce to any brand you wanted to. And it was not a lifestyle I wanted. I wasn't giving an expat and live over there. Yeah, it's fun to build. Not that I needed the attention or I needed accolades because I brought boots to market, but I missed that part. And at the end of the day, I love snowboarding. I mean, I wanted to be that versus being in a hot factory in Thailand or Tai Chung or wherever. After a while, it was, it was great run. But I came back and basically talked to, it was between my boss and the director of marketing at the time said, hey, is there any way I could do kind of a hybrid thing here? Because I don't mind it now, but I don't want to be doing this forever, going over to Asia and doing all that. So slowly but surely, I, I got on more responsibility on the snow side. And then fast forward, they ended up moving the company to Colorado, 
which was just music to my ears. Yeah. I've been here ever since. So it was a progression, but it was something where I was like, hey, this is how I can help you on the marketing side. And I have the relationships with the athletes. And back to when you're asking about music and warp tour, I'd said to them, hey, these guys and girls in these bands, I could get shoes on their feet. I just need a huge inventory and I'll go on Warp Tour and take care of these bands. And they loved it. And that's why I'm still friends to a lot of these bands to this day that I used to give shoes when they were living out of a van. And, and funny that I think the socks went farther than the shoes. They were just so <laughs> thankful for it. But they were really like the fact that I came in as kind of a marketing thing going, hey, we're missing a boat here with music too. So it's not like we had a music division of Airwalk, but they were totally cool with me taking care of that because they knew that, especially in the videos back in the day, I mean, these punk bands would die like lag wagon, you know, to get their song in a snow video. That was yep. a big deal back then. And that spoke to me. Oh my God, punk rock, I grew up on seeing its first Avenue or 7th Street entry. And now they're in a snow video. Wow. And, and even, you know, the punk rock, especially in a skate video back in the day. That to me is like the best of all worlds. Now it is time for my last sponsor break. And my final sponsor is Peter Glenn Ski and Sports. For over 60 years, they have been getting people on the snow, in the water, and on the pavement. Not only have they provided a great retail experience, they also play against the big internet guys. Over on their website, peterglenn.com, you'll find great brands, great products, and deals. Peter Glenn also offers shipping on orders over $49. They'll match the price found at other websites. If you need something ski, snowboard, wakeboard, or inline skate related, head on over to peterglenn.com. Those are my sponsors. Now let's get back into the podcast. Things start changing in Airwalk, and I don't know what's going on with all the behind the scenes stuff, but by 99, Airwalk had to sell to Sunrise Capital Partners. And when something like that happens to a core brand, is everyone scared for their job, or what does the vibe turn into inside the walls of Airwalk? Oh, God. I don't know how I made it through all that, to be honest with you. I really don't, because it was a bloodbath. And for whatever reason, I hung on by my fingernails and, you know, I would have figured something else out, but it was pretty heavy what went down. And that's when they made the decision to move to Colorado. And that instantly, instantly opened up a larger pool of talent that would want to come to Colorado. Yep. So what I'm getting at is that I survived it and happily moved out here. And back then, you know, I bought a house on some land. <laughs> it would be hard to do in these days with what's going on. And we were based in Genesee, Colorado, which is basically between Golden and Evergreen. And we started building a good team, a solid team of people that got it. The unfortunate thing, more than I'll ever know, was just the financial straits we were in. And then not to mention just the beating the brand had taken. Because you never see the forest through the trees. You know when one of your athletes who actually has a shoe, they ran like a signature shoe shows up on the cover of Thrasher with a competitor on. <laughs> that could be a bigger slap in the face, yeah. right? And very disrespectful. And that's not cool to this day. I'll stand by the fact that's just not right. You don't do that. Call no. the Midwestern roots in me, whatever. You just don't do that, especially when you're getting paid. So that's a whole number of story. But when your athletes and everyone else don't even really feel pumped wearing your brand anymore, that's not good. You've lost brand equity big time. So the unfortunate thing is, you know, we hire a, a rock star like Mike Arts, but it's just too late. And he and my counterparts, we fought the best fight we could, but it was just, it's like using a teaspoon to try to save a ship from sinking, you know, trying to bail it out. Yeah. It wasn't going to happen. And you didn't want to think that at the time because we were still running in those circles of snow, skate, music, you know, all that. But the brand just didn't mean anything. It, it was a has-been at that point. It, it had been too, there was no aspire to aspect of Airwalk anymore. No, you go to Payless and you buy Airwalk, you know, wherever you buy discount yeah. shoes is where Airwalk was sold. And then 2003, Collective Licensing International comes in. And what might have been a sinking ship seems to even go further because I look at the licensing of Airwalk and licensing of all brands. Like right now, who's doing licensing right is whoever's making those body glove paddle boards. They are everywhere and they're probably raking in money for body glove. But when Airwalk started licensing shit out, it was crazy to see Airwalk rollerblades out on the marketplace. And the second you see that, I wouldn't think any skateboarder would ever want to be associated with Airwalk again. And how do those things happen? Do they not consult with you on some of the things they're making? Well, some of those decisions were made without any of us knowing it. Yeah. By 2003, everyone that spring knew the handwriting was on the wall. I hate to say it, but it wasn't if, it was when. And yeah, there were some decisions made there where you just shook your head. And I remember we had a national sales meeting and I was getting on a plane to go to the Transworld Snow Conference up in Banff. 
And I ended up sitting next to, who at the time was the director of sales for Nixon Watches. I'd known him and his wife for a long time from the industry. And this is no joke. And we're sitting down. And all of a sudden, a couple of the Canadian distributor guys for Airwalk come walking by them. And they're like, hey, Stiggs, what's happening? High five. And they're carrying, I'm not kidding you, the little handle, Airwalk scooters. Okay? <laughs> scooters, right? So his name is Mike Hofer. Mike turns to me and he's like, this is a joke, right? And I'm like, dude, don't even get me started. I felt so low at that point because he was looking at me like, you know, I was just reading the person's body English. He was looking like, you're better than that, man. You know what I mean? It's embarrassing, I would think. Yeah, but he just looked at me like he didn't say it. He wanted to roll his eyes, but probably knew that that was just like insult to injury yep. at that point. But I was like, dude, you have no idea. But literally, we walked in the, the night, the final dinner for this sales meeting, and there was an Airwalk scooter on everybody's chair. <laughs> and I remember it was almost like a nervous laughter for some of us. And I got to believe one or two of them just walked out. Like the guy ran skate for us. It was like, I'm out of here. Not walked out of the brand, but just couldn't even believe. That's mortifying that they thought they were doing something good. It was like kryptonite was on a seat, you know? Yeah. So that was, that was just, I don't need to tell you any more than that. I mean, that's the direction it went. But you were there for the glory days of an iconic company, one that was really changing shit by 1996, and they were disrupting the standard shoe market. Your next job is with another disruptor in Red Bull. And first, are you looking for a new gig because Airwalk's in the toilet and has kind of become a joke? Or how did the Red Bull conversation start? Yeah, I mean, it did that. And ironically, one of the Airwalk athletes his name is Zach Leach. was one of the one of the first snowboarders on Red Bull, and I'll never forget Super Park was at Breckenridge, and Zach had come to town. And he was really good, really, really involved in like ideas on product, on marketing. He's just that type of guy. Mm -hmm. Zach, you know, Zach was the man, and he was wearing a Red Bull beanie, and I was like, "What the hell is that?" He's like, "It's this energy drink." I'm like, "What the hell is an energy drink?" Like, I just didn't know what he was talking about, and he ended up introducing me to the marketing guy from Red Bull at the time, kind of handled the team stuff. And it was cool, but in the back of my head, it kind of reminded me of my early days of Airwalk, where I was like, I could do a lot with this. And no offense to this person, but I could do a lot with this. So as it turns out, a guy that had been let go from Airwalk, who's still a really good friend of mine, became the local field rep for Red Bull. And as they grew, all of a sudden, this dream position was created. It didn't even exist. Yeah, sports marketing manager. And literally, it comes back to what I said earlier in the conversation. It's not what you know, it's who you know. But basically, I was fast-tracked to the hiring manager. It's like, you got to talk to this guy, Six. You got to talk to this guy. And it took a while. You know, it took like a year for me to get hired. But it was worth lesson learned. Something you really want bad that you know, you know is it, it's worth it. And so I, in the meantime, worked for a promotion company here in town. It was, it was basically commission. I mean, we're talking like scrim tents, you know, that kind of thing for yep. events, chloroplast. And I ended up overnight getting Vance as a client, Burton, Gravis, Sims, when they did the Sims Invitational. So like, that was easy. That was like low hanging fruit for me, but it still wasn't fulfilling in the slightest. It was just like, I'm selling promotional stuff, which is fine. I mean, I, I kept the hustle going, but that was short lived because at the same time I was talking to Red Bull and the Red Bull thing happened. And it was just the rest is history because I just remember they gave me an offer and I just remember exactly where I was. And it was life-changing for many, many reasons. They paid me more than I'd ever been paid before. I couldn't believe it. And they treat, you know, Red Bull's insane. It was just, a, it was such a next level thing. It would be like working at the Gap and all of a sudden you work at Louis Vuitton. And I'm not kidding you. I'm not trying to be funny. Like that's literally how high-end Red Bull is. I don't know how they operate now, but back then it was next level the way they treated the, the employees. And back then it was, if the flight was over four hours or if it was first class and we're staying in the nicest hotels, but- one of the things that was right in my wheelhouse is that their big thing was take care of the athletes. And that was something that just not only is a way I treat a person, it's just take care of them, do the little things, make them be proud to be a part of this brand. And this athlete, they're all scrutinized because they're, they better take our brand to the next level, but give them the tools to do so. So let's think of crazy, as you say, disruptor, disrupting things to do. That's what we did. We'd say, hey, what is your dream, Zach, for a jump? Hey, what is your dream, Miss Mountain Biker, what would you like to do? Hey, Mr. Base Jumper, what can we do for you? There were so many to draw from. The nice part is I was already in Colorado where pretty much 90% of the Red Bull activities were happening. Yep. You know what I mean? Because we had similar topography to Austria where it was born, but the Austrians at that point had like a dotted line. Austria Red Bull wasn't what it was back then, what it is now. And 
it was absolutely amazing. The best way to describe it would be imagine you are that person that grew up wherever and you come from nothing and you're an amazing athlete and all of a sudden you sign that first huge contract. That's what it felt like. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, it's like a whole new world is open to you. It's just like the action sports world on steroids. That's amazing. So that's how it came to be. Yeah. And if Airwalk shit the bed like it did, I'm going to imagine it wasn't run well. But at Red Bull, they do things totally different. Like nothing's really loose with them. While everything looks loose and fun, there's a, a level of attention to detail that most other brands don't work with. And did that take a little while to get used to? Or is that just how you operate anyway? Yeah. I mean, some things was fit right out of the gate. But I came from Airwalk where you're trying to keep the brand alive and giving everyone and their mother, you know, not just anyone you want to pick and choose, but like getting product in people's feet, getting them swag, getting whatever to the total opposite of Red Bull where they're like, yeah, you can't even have the logo. I'll never forget my first day in the office in Austria. I'm like, Hey, do you think I get a couple stickers for my snowboard? And they're like, no, absolutely not. (laughs) And I thought they were joking. And I'm like, no, man, you're not an athlete. These only go for our athletes. That's it. And at the time they had really crappy Apparel, meaning it wasn't American apparel t-shirts. They were boxy, crappy shirts. The hoodies would pill right away, but everybody wanted to get their hands on them. And you rocked Red Bull into an event and you were someone. You just, you walked in and it was like, you are someone. That was their whole thing. We're going to have the best. And then we're going to curate the best. We're going to get everything we can out of this athlete while taking care of them, not using them. You know, yeah, you want to enhance the brand and build the brand equity. But it was always treat these athletes as professionals. You treat a kayaker the same way you treat the cliff diver, the same way you treat the guys who do air race, you know? And it was really cool to see that. And who are we kidding here? European culture is just more sophisticated. It is. You know, look at the Red Bull office. I mean, you walk in there, the headquarters in Fuchsville, there's not even any Red Bull branding. I mean, you're walking to this crazy design building, and I urge any of you to just Google Red Bull headquarters in Fuchsville. You would not know it's Red Bull HQ. Huh. And you walk by people's desks and there's nothing on their desk. It's so simplistic. It's almost like an Apple store. That's the best way to describe. And I haven't been to HQ and Fuchsville in 13 years, wherever it's been, but that's the way it was. But it was just, they didn't need the clutter. They didn't think that's like, we're going to get down to business, but they were really good. They wanted ideas. And that was the most stressful part about my job was when I was hired was when we did things called the channel crossing. When the Red Bull athlete, Felix Baumgartner, he's the same guy who jumped out of that space capsule. Yep. He put on a fixed wing, whatever, pack and went across the English Channel. It got worldwide attention. And in typical Red Bull fashion, there's no way you could edit anything without seeing Red Bull branding. Yep. <laughs> They're so good about that that you, there's no way New York Times, USA Today, CNN, AP could cut out the Red Bull branding. And from then forward, it was like, what's our next channel crossing? So you yourself, try to be put in that spot right now. If I said you, you have unlimited funds, but you have to move the needle for us. That's a lot of pressure. Now it's as much pressure as you want to put in yourself, but because I'm anal retentive, of course, I'm sitting there going, you know, wow. They expect a lot. Cause you know, they don't want to hear about a rail jam. Okay. They don't want to hear about a big air competition. If it's a big air competition, it better be over a chasm yeah. in the Alps and <laughs> Himalaya somewhere. You know what I mean? Yeah. And there's gotta be a story behind it. So I learned so much about marketing with Red Bull where there, there had to be a reason behind what you were doing. You didn't just do a stunt. You know what I'm saying? You had to do something that made, if nothing else too, it showed respect to the area. So there's, there had to be a story behind it. And there wasn't just, let's go pay a bunch of money to go do something. But some of these athletes, there's some that have been there for decades now, but they keep reinventing themselves. And that's beautiful what they're doing. And they're getting to see the world and these amazing things because of this amazing content that is used outside of just action sports realm. People just want to use it for like wide world of sports. You know, they always had that famous thing where everyone would tune in, just watch that guy wipe out on the skis. Remember that? That Yeah. But people would use Red Bull clips because they were just too beautiful not to. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, with Red Bull, they're known for the ridiculous budgets and first class everything and a level of hospitality that no one else offers. But when you're working with the athletes, you're also offering them a ton of different sports science things that I think Red Bull was kind of the pioneer on, on trying to make their athletes better. And I'm guessing that you were involved in signing athletes and working with them as well. Is that something that's leveraged or is that just some icing on the cake for a Red Bull athlete? To be a Red Bull athlete? When they get signed, you know, when you're working and negotiating a a deal with an athlete, Mm -hmm. all the sports science that goes along with that, is that something that's negotiated into the contract? Like, 
hey, we've got all these things that can make you better and that's why you're making this money? Or is there a lump sum of money first and then you're like, and you have all this bonus stuff that's going to make you better as an athlete? Well, back then, I'm sure stuff has changed, but depending on the discipline, we would match their winning if they went gold or silver or whatever. My memory serves me, first of all, you had to have Red Bull headwear on all the time. They own your head. That's like part of the game. Yes, that's brilliant because they didn't care about the hoodies or t-shirts, but they knew if you podiumed or you're being interviewed, you had to have a Red Bull hat on. No other sponsors. There's that part, but it all varied because if I had a sled athlete, let's say, and a snowboarder and a BMXer, their contracts look different because they're different expectations where a BMXer, we'd maybe say, what's the craziest thing you want to do in the street? Skier, is the person a ski mountaineer or are they strictly a park rat? You know what I mean? If so, how are we going to have fun with that? You know, but there definitely was kind of without saying it, it was the right idea. They had an open checkbook and we'd have to pay attention to kind of what the market would bear. I'm friends with a lot of agents. So I'd kind of get an idea of what athletes were commanding at the time. But again, man, what a Travis Pastrana makes is a lot different than, you know, one of the Bostroms makes. It just depended, man. There's so much to it. And and analytics are different back then than they are now. Now you can even get down to the brass tacks on what someone's bringing in, try to scale it, so to speak. But it was fun because you could sit down with the athlete. Yeah, there was a certain amount they were going to get paid. But if the athlete was smart, they realized that, yeah, it might not be dollars in their pocket, but Red Bull could take your brand to the next level. Meaning, hey, Mr. or Mrs. Snowboarder, you could be next level if we help pull off this either athlete project with you or let's think of an event that you bring in your peers. And we'll do a fun event, but it's got to be unique. It can't be just another BMX track race or whatever it may be. We're giving you a platform to do something great. And the smart ones really, really took advantage of that. And there are other ones that looked at it like Red Bull is just another sponsor. And that didn't last real long. Yeah. Let's put it that way. And in terms of owning their head, like we said, is there a police on that point from the Red Bull side where you're looking and seeing media? And if an athlete is pictured on a podium without a Red Bull hat on, what happens? In an extreme case, they were terminated immediately just because that's what we paid you for. That's what, that's you what asked we for. trained you for. Yeah. And it's very clear in the writing. It doesn't say we own your head. You were basically signed to say you were going to wear the required headwear or whatever is that when you're podium. And look at Lindsay Vaughn. I mean, you can't see a photo of her on so without a rebel hat on. Yep. Front and center. She's no dummy. She understands she's got a Lindsay Vaughn brand. She's a good class example. We had, I believe it was a motocross athlete a long time ago. His better half, I don't know if his wife or girlfriend, was running around with a hat on and he got terminated. She was running around with this hat that was supposed to be for him and didn't listen. We'd warned him and that was it. And then, of course, if my memory serves me, the reaction was not good. Very kind of childish almost. And then it was like kind of the true colors were shown and it was probably the good thing for both parties. Let's put it that way. Yep. So, yeah, if you didn't want to call from Austria. Let's put it that way. <laughs> you got a call from Austria. It was not good. In that realm, meaning if they're going to call you about, ask about an athlete, eh, that means I'm not doing my job. It never happened to me on my watch, but a few slipped through here and there because maybe that was, you know, an athlete that was really out of Santa Monica because that was our headquarters in the US, which still is. And then again, it happens and whatever, but you'd hope that athletes would be smarter than that and show the respect to a brand that's really taking care of you. Yeah. And where earlier you said Airwalk could be looked at as you getting your MBA, I almost look at it as Airwalk is like your college of action sports. And then when you go to Red Bull, it's like the Harvard, and that's where you get your master's from. But with Red Bull, you get a total another set of tools completely because of all the things that they've done and all the the brilliant minds that work there. And you're there for the glory years. I have friends who still work for the brand and friends who have left. And it seems like towards the end of your time there, there started to be sort of a shuffling of the deck at Red Bull. That's what happens with growth. Is that the reasoning for you wanting to get out of the wings world? Yeah, it's a combination of a lot of things. And they did do a restructure and the sports marketing managers, we weren't affected by it because they needed us. One of my counterparts, he's way ahead of the game. And he turned to me at the meeting when they announced it. And he's like, I'm out of here. And I'm like, what are you talking about? You're out of here. And he's like, this isn't going to work. This is not for us, sports marketing managers, because Basically, they decentralized us and had us report to a regional office versus reporting right to Santa Monica and then having a dotted line to Austria. Yeah. So those kind of stopped. And when you're, you know, you don't have a direct line to people really moving the needle. What happened is it kind of came back to, I started to shudder like when Airwalk went from Carlsbad to Pennsylvania, 
that soul of that brand was ripped out. No pun intended. But like the people who really made Airwalk cool, like no way they were going to budge and right. move to Pennsylvania. And that's no disrespect to Pennsylvania. They're just like, I'm not going to move there. So I started getting shows X. I'm thinking, wait a second. The people who are really moving the needle and, and have their finger on the pulse of what's happening with Red Bull because they're in direct contact with Austria are in Santa Monica. Was I still dotted line to Santa Monica? Sure. You know, we still have our means, but I should have seen their handwriting in the wall sooner. And it was really kind of a happy accident how Pabst came up because actually there was a guy that worked at Red Bull who went over to Pabst. And it was just the way the world works, man. It, it happened since I ended up getting introduced to who was my boss for a while at Pabst who brought me in. I mean, that's really kind of how it happened. I wish I could say it was some uh -huh, miracle. Moment. It wasn't. It was like perfect timing. Yeah. You know, the way it all unfolded. And you get to Pabst when there's already a surge in that brand, I feel like. People are starting to talk about PBR again. I know because I was working for K2 at that time. We had a connection with the brand and we were making vintage ski sweaters, custom skis. I think we made snowboards, but I'm not even sure. And it was an awesome collaboration. And then you came in and killed it. Why? Well, I appreciate it. That's <laughs> nice of you to say it. But, you know, people have said that. And I'm experiencing this now in my current gig where that's great and all. Anyone could be handed an amazing brand. But just because you're handed amazing, you still have to keep the momentum going. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because I don't care if you're one of the surf skater snow brands, because it's proven that even if you're the cool guy or girl, that doesn't mean the brand's going to keep going just because you're there. You've got to reinvent all the time, but it also comes down to the people and you're on the same page. And I think that it was, it was a perfect storm. And I appreciate you saying that. And I'd like to think, you know, it had a hand on the wheel where the brand was going, but we had an amazing weapon. And that was this field marketing crew that we had. And they were given enough rope to hang themselves, but also could speak up when we have meetings. And you know, that doesn't work in my market. And all these things I learned that were played in our favors, we never gave some slogan. What was cool in some cities is not cool in other cities, which I've said before. But I really, when I think back on it, our weapon was these field marketing crew. And then on top of it, they gave me full open runway to do product collaborations with brands. And because of my development experience, no one had to touch anything. I'd get approval, like, do you guys like the branding on this? But I did the whole thing soup to nuts. Oh, nice. I didn't have anyone have to work with me with timelines, production, any of that. I understood all of it. So that went right in my wheelhouse. By the way, the K2 stuff looked great. I mean, I, I still have some of the, the ski. I don't ski, but I have still have the skis. But there's boards. They did the sweater. There were some hats and things like that. That stuff turned out great. But when I stepped in, I'm like, oh, my God, we could blow this up. And I wanted to use some of... What have a Red Bull where I wanted to keep things limited? Yeah, you couldn't get your hands on it, but not so strict. It was like you have to be the best athlete. But you know what? Yeah, I'm going to look out for the cool girl who's the ski patrol. I'm going to look out for the guy who does the soundboard at the local music venue. You know what I mean? Those are the people we want to take care of. You've always been that way, like taking care of the infrastructure and the dark men behind the scenes. They're all taken care of, and everybody sees that as like all these important people making this event happen are decked out in your brands, and that's always worked in your favor. Yeah, it has. And also our employees. I mean, my counterparts in marketing, the two guys that originally brought me in, I'm still tight with them. We talk all the time. They've, they've moved on to other things. But at the end of being at PAPS, like we had a whole music program, we had a whole art program. Both of those guys started as field marketing managers in the field. That's and cool. they worked their way up, and they did it, but they lived and breathed it. And the cool part is, as we grew as a brand, I could turn to them and went back when we were talking about Warped Tour and these bands I know and say, hey, just so you know, I'm giving some gear to this band. And he's like, great, cool. Or I'd say, hey, you know what? I just ran into these guys. They love a mural outside their building or, you know, whether it be a, a shop or a bar. And my counterpart in art was like, great. I know of an artist, you know? So it just, it worked. We had the right people in place. And I can't stress that enough because frankly, I think we did more scrutiny hiring people at PAPS than we did at Red Bull because you just wanted to make sure you had the right fit. Your numbers are limited there, too. I would think it's a smaller operation in terms of marketing oh. people. Oh, yeah. I mean, oh, yeah. Every hire counts. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I, was, I went back to staying at Red Roof Inns again, which is fine. I'm not above that. But the brand equity was insane. I mean, in all honesty, there was parts of that as, as time progressed at PAPS where my Red Bull counterparts would have loved to be able to get the consumers we had. It was so amazing to see, you know, though we didn't have much money, and we were in a recession when I started there. The brand hadn't been shoved down people's throats. It was cheap. It's an iconic. You can't miss that can or branding from a mile away. And the other part that has some heritage to it, everyone had a story about it. Yep. You know, everyone seemed to say, and you'd always get the haters, you know, it was the crappy college beer. Well, great. 
you know, good for you. I'm glad you at least got something when you're in college, you know, like, <laughs> so that's fine. But they're also the same people after the fact, the other side of their mouth asking you if they can have a trucker hat. I can't stress that enough, but, you know, companies want to like use PAPS as a case study, which is legit. But if you really want to build a lifestyle, a brand that's going to, you know, have touch points for people, you got to get the right people. And we were just so lucky that we had the right people that were so passionate about the brand. It sounds like you created a wings team of like cool people, you know, where the wings team on Red Bull seems to be giving out samples everywhere. You just had like the cool people in each city and you're able to penetrate every market in the country that way, which is genius. That had gotten going before I got to PAPS, but it was managed outside the company. And that was one thing that at first I was like, because Red Bull never outsourced. I mean, they always had the reins on all their brands or anything. And you know, I get it. They wanted to protect their brand equity, right? They didn't want to outsource it. Not that they didn't hire event producers, but they just, as far as what partners we had, where it was going to be, they were very, very strict about that. A lot of agencies don't get it. Yeah. Oh, 100%. 100%. I never allowed us to have an agency. I mean, speaking for me, I had my two cents. I was like, no, if our brand team, I'm like, no, absolutely not. But we didn't need one because our brand team was the agency. Does yeah. that make sense? Because everyone do it. So this brand team existed, the FMR program, but it was managed outside the company. Well, when there was change, we, we had someone purchase us. It was actually purchased twice in my time there. And as soon as this entrepreneur came aboard, he looked at the sheet, our budgets, and he's like, why are we paying this company? No, bring everyone in the house, which ended up being awesome. So all those employees, that those who wanted to, became full-time employees, which is cool. And then we hit the gas and didn't look back. You know, Not that we weren't with this outside agency, not they were bad or anything like that. It was just, you lose something there. They don't get your brand as well as you guys get your brand. And there's no way they could ever do it. Exactly. And then there's just the disconnect of, at the end of the day, they're the ones processing the paychecks for these people. So they had puppet strings too on this whole thing. You yeah. know, So again, that was no disrespect to that agency. They did their thing and got that framework in place for how we were going to manage the program. But then we brought it inside. But to be honest with you, it really wasn't that big of a transformation. Everyone knew their marching orders for the most part. It was just, we had to do more internal managing, get HR involved and et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, that was one of the things that just Big Beer didn't understand that. Yeah. They, they just didn't get it. And we had so much fun messing with the Big Beer brands because we did everything they couldn't do or wouldn't do. But it's, it's a lot of hard work. It's a lot of late nights and all that. And people are innately lazy and they don't want to do that. But if you're passionate about a brand, you will do that. And it sounds like you and your team were doing that at this point. I haven't even talked about Liquid Death yet. So I'm going to bring up Liquid Death, which is your next project. We'll say PBR was sold a couple times. Uh, eventually, I think they were bought by Russian people. And I don't know if that was the reason that you decided to leave PBR or what happened. But eventually, you do leave PBR and you go to this company, Liquid Death. And it's kind of like great for your career trajectory. First, you start with Airwalk and all the cool kids in action sports. They grow up a little bit and get into energy drinks and start drinking them. Then they get into beer and start drinking beer. Then they get older and realize they don't want to drink beer a shit ton anymore. And the next thing they want is water and no water in the world is cool until liquid death comes out. And is that the idea is like, we're going to make water cool? I got to give credit to Mike Cesario, our, our CEO and founder. He had the vision because he's a creative by trade. That's what he did for his career. And he was just fed up with CPG in general. Consumer packaged goods are just boring. It's very safe. Everyone stays in their lanes. Yeah, you can talk about brands being, quote, you know, disruptors, but they aren't really. You're fighting over end caps. Exactly. It's prep school and when someone untucks their shirt. Yeah. <laughs> That's about it. And it was music to my ears because we were connected. And it's so funny. We were connected because a guy that I go on a snowboard trip with every year's brother is one of the investors. So literally the month after the company was founded, I was connected with Liquid Death, got samples sent to me. And Mike looks at Liquid Death like the way I did PAPS and where it's not about the liquid, it's about the brand. So I think you'd get almost agitated if I call us a water brand. No, we're a brand. And yes, the water business, it just chugs along and does its thing. But it can almost be a little bit arrogant, to be honest with you. Because if you've ever been around people that are way into, whether it be road biking or yoga, some people almost like get a little arrogant about how in shape they are. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So like water's got this kind of little thing. And most Americans don't want to hear that. They don't want to hear it. They don't want to see your selfies and like that. We don't, great. Good for you. Throw me a football. So there's that part of it, but Mike grew up playing in bands, likes punk rock, loves to skate, loves to snowboard. So there's so many things that we had in common. And the first time we talked on the phone, I think we were on the phone for two hours. The thing was, he wasn't ready at that point to bring me on. And 
I couldn't ask for a better situation because now I'm kind of able to take all of what I learned at these different brands on how to market to people, what works, what doesn't work. But now I have a product, unlike, you know, unfortunately, energy drinks have a bad connotation to them. Alcohol, need I say more? You know, it's very polarizing. Not only is it polarizing, but then you've got beer snobs. You've got people saying, I don't like beer or your beer sucks or whatever. I've got something that no one can refuse. Everyone needs it. Every animal and person on this earth or fauna needs it. It's water. Yep. And so why not have it? But, but even more importantly is that if you look, and I don't know the exact percentage, but there's like 70 some percentage of aluminum in circulation to this day is from like the late 1800s or something. So it's like infinitely recyclable material. So that coupled with the fact that if you really break down some of these waters that have fancy names or whatever, it's tap water. It's municipal tap water. And we're ironically canned down the road from Red Bull in Austria, but there's only a handful of facilities on this earth that have a spring that feeds into a canning facility. So there's no transporting the water. It goes right into canning. It's that pure. And we can stand behind that. And so it's all these parts to it. But on top of it, it's all about having fun and not taking yourself too seriously. And it's like, what's the dumbest thing we can do? <laughs> you know what I mean, like just not only do we have a good story, the recycling part, and we do donate. We have a couple organizations that we support, help clean up. We donate every can sold to cleaning up the oceans of the plastic because it is so bad. But it's just all of the things that I've been doing all along in one place. But to add to it, I can spread my net even further because water I can give to a newborn. I could give it to an elderly person. It's water. And we're finding also people who are sober. It's the placebo effect where they're like, wow, they're at a bar. They don't no longer have a glass in their hand with a lime in it. They have a can. You know, and we were starting to make some traction in the on-premise, then COVID hit, or people are designated drivers, but teenagers think, you know, it looks like they're drinking beer. You know, our exploding water, the sparkling is in a black can, looks like a Guinness can. Yep. And the other one, people say it looks like Modelo. My kid, whenever I drink it, he says, hey, dad, you're drinking beer. It's like noon. And I'm like, no, it's water, He's buddy. It's 8 a.m. Yeah. And I've had parents say to me, because of you, my child wants to hydrate. You know, that's, that's a cool. win-win all around. Yeah. You know, we're not some big brand or anything like that, but I love it. It's like a combination of the Red Bull Paps experience because it's a brand that people are like, what's going on here? You're doing cool stuff. But then it's something where we're taking something that's been around and making it cool. Yeah. So beer has been around forever, but I would have liked to have thought back in the day with Paps when someone had a can in there and they felt cooler because they had it in their hand. It is a cool water doing some amazing marketing things that I think everybody should check out all your social media stuff because you do some fun stuff that other people probably wouldn't do. And then you look at the packaging and the copy and it's laugh out loud, funny and beautiful packaging. So you guys are doing something right and they've got the right people in place there. I've kept you on the line for a while and I have a final segment of the show that I'm going to get you to do. It's called Inappropriate Questions. And what I do is I get someone that you know to ask you three inappropriate questions and they can be anything. And I was able to get James Clifford on the line to be able to ask <laughs> some questions for you. And I'm going to cue James up right now for question number one. Okay. Sticks, you now have worked for a beer company and a water company and, oh, yeah, an energy drink company. What's the weirdest thing you've ever seen anyone, including you, do with a can? That's a good one. God, that's a really good one. You know, this isn't. And I have a picture of it. It's not really that funny or cool, but, but a guy literally who was building a rat rod took a Pabst, I want to say it was the 40 ounce can, I think it might have been the 16 ounce can, and literally had it as a scoop for the top of his engine, of his <laughs> rat rod. I have a picture of it. I can send it to you. But that right off my top of my head, that was something where it's like, holy crap, and it was a legit can. It wasn't painted. He literally took a can and somehow manipulated it to be, I want to say, the intake or something for the top of his engine. It's crazy. That is pretty cool. I could show you something else on the internet that would really blow your mind with the Paps can, but we don't need to talk about that. I was about to say, my mind went elsewhere, but yeah, I, <laughs> yeah, but that would be the craziest thing I probably saw. And it's not crazy as it is really cool, like inventive. Yeah. Creative stuff. MacGyver, you know? Yep. All right, we're going to go with question number two. Over the years, you have collaborated with some rad brands on some pretty cool swag items. What's the strangest one that never made the production floor? And do you have any of them still left? Wow. Um, let me think here. That never saw the light of day. Um, God. Oh, wow. Um, back to Pabst again. One of the oddest things was I met this guy in Chicago who made a keg tap, but it's for like if you're at a tailgate or whatever else. 
and it had a foot pump. It almost looked like a pedal. You'd have a wah-wah pedal for a guitar. Yeah. It had four beer taps coming out the top of it. Huh. So you'd pump this thing where you're talking to people to look like a tap. And then it would, it, it was like a, an octopus and they came out everywhere and they never went anywhere. I presented them and everyone, but that wasn't really my idea per se. And I forget the name of the company, but that was really actually would have been a really cool product had it, had it seen the light of day, but that, that would be it. And then I'm trying to think what else, anything from Red Bull, that was really hard to push anything through with them. Though they did let me make a brand, a, a snow cat. That was always the big feather in my cap is I had my own snow cat on call. Nice. So that was fun. That's amazing. All right. We will go with your final inappropriate question. And we got one more question from LP Paul Crandall. Clearly you have success over the years. How do you justify to the bean counters of the world why giving away so much rad, unique shit is important for the brand? How do you explain this to people who don't get it? Honestly, it's funny how quick they change their opinion if they get one. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So like, <laughs> yeah. if I do it, but it's a really fair question because the hardest part of my career is how I'm able to justify my existence. Because unlike someone in accounting or sales where you have numbers you can actually look at, it's tough when I do these one-off items, but even the brands that I've worked with, they don't even question it. They're like, oh, this is a done deal. I mean, I, this totally makes sense. And I'll use the jacket, the Sixer jacket we did with 686. Mike West, who's been a longtime friend of mine, he saw the marketing value. Now, they went and did formal ads, and a little Vimeo clip and whatnot. But internally, I wasn't pushed back because like, yeah, that makes sense. It's building brand equity. But the people up top are like, why are you doing this? But they didn't understand that I used our brand equity to pay for the jackets. We didn't even pay for them. And they had them done. But then all of a sudden they realized when one of the executives went to Mammoth that he really could have used one. And then it all changed. And then they want to talk about it. And then they're showing their buddies. You know, he'd look at this jacket. So it took some selling at first. But then they couldn't wait for our next meetings. It'll be quarterly when I come up with, the, here's the next coloration. Here's the next brand we're going to work with. But it, out of the gate, a lot of skepticism. A lot. But it just took, I think once people touch and feel something, it completely changes their opinion. Well, Styx, your career is like a lesson in branding and tenacity. I mean, you should never have been in the action sports industry growing up in cake eating Edina, but you were able <laughs> to get the pinnacle jobs of not just action sports, but beer and now water. And you've done it your own way, a way of, you know, giving away the farm per se to get people more stoked on the brand. I mean, you give out probably more product than anyone. You don't pay to be a part of any event because people want your products and it's been successful everywhere you've went. And it's cool to hear your story. I thank you for your time. Well, I just, I can't thank you enough. And I'm going to say this sounds cliche, but I just got to thank everyone I've worked with and the brand that we've been able to collaborate with because you're only as good as your team, right? And yep. that sounds again, totally cliche, but there's no way if we didn't have killers at even the Airwalk days, but Red Bull and then Paps and then now even at Liquid Death. It's a small team. It's a really solid team. And we all are on the same page with things. So I just can't thank you enough for having me. I really appreciate and respect what you do. And I'm flattered to be a part of the roster of people you've had on this. So thank you. So that was time with Sticks. And my big takeaway after talking with Steve is that life is all about timing. Sticks timed every one of his opportunities perfectly. And the way he did it was making shit happen for himself. No one was calling on the kid from Edina to come run their snowboard brand, but he made that shit happen. And a lot of times, that's how people get their start. And if you're looking for a job in the industry, do what Steve did. Make something happen for yourself. It's not that hard. If you have a passion and you have the knowledge and you have the tenacity, you can make that shit happen. I did it here with this podcast, and you can do it anywhere in life. That's the podcast for this week. At this point, I want to ask you to review me on iTunes. To do that, even if you're already a subscriber, click the podcast icon on your iPhone. Search for the Powell Movement, click my logo, scroll down to where you see the five stars, click five stars, and you're done. It's that easy, and it should help the show grow. It also makes me feel really good when you write a five-star review with some copy behind it, but do whatever you think is right. I also want to thank you for listening and ask you to support my great sponsors who make this thing happen. They are Stanley, Peter Glenn Ski and Sports, and the Ten Barrel Brewery. Have a great week, everyone.